Final Fantasy VII changed the landscape of gaming as we know it. If you like JRPGs, there's a very good chance you owe FF7 thanks, because many games likely wouldn't have been imported to the States had it not been for this one particular game. In fact, the impact of Final Fantasy VII goes well beyond just JRPGs. From Western appreciation of a new genre to console wars, this is how Final Fantasy VII changed everything. Both the Sega Saturn and Sony PlayStation released in Japan in 1994, and North America and the EU in 1995. Before that, the Super Nintendo and Sega Genesis seemed unstoppable. While Sega had proven in the States that they could rival Nintendo, for the most part, this seemed like an odd one out. I mean, after all, the 3DO, the Jaguar, the CDI, and the Neo Geo failed to compete. The TurboGrafx-16 failed in the States, although it did surprisingly well in Japan. The point is, the Sony PlayStation was an outsider trying to fight its way into an incredibly difficult market space. Meanwhile, in the West, RPGs really weren't selling all that well, especially on consoles. As a Super Nintendo boy, some of my favorite games growing up were JRPGs, but the sales data for them is actually kind of shocking. Take Chrono Trigger. It's my favorite game of all time and released in 1995. It's a game that isn't only revered as one of the greatest JRPGs of all time, but one of the greatest video games of all time. And while it sold 2.36 million units in Japan, abroad it sold 290,000 units. Now, 300,000 might sound like a lot, but comparatively, outside of Japan, it really didn't sell all that well. The pattern was pretty standard for most JRPGs on the SNES. Secret of Mana sold 1.5 million units in Japan, it sold 330,000 units abroad, while Final Fantasy IV sold 1.82 million units in Japan, it sold 340,000 units abroad. In fact, because Squaresoft was so concerned with how poorly their game sold outside of Japan, they specifically made a game just for the US to entice people to play Final Fantasy and introduce the West to JRPGs. Final Fantasy Mystic Quest Released to North America in 1992, Japan in 1993, and Europe in 1994, making it the first Final Fantasy released in Europe. Unlike standard Final Fantasy games of the time, there were no random battles, but players would instead initiate battles by walking into sprites of enemies on the map. More action-adventure elements were added to the exploration segments to entice a Western audience, and unlike other Final Fantasy games, you could save anywhere. Despite all of this, the game failed to bring Final Fantasy to the mainstream. Mystic Quest was received okay with middling reviews, but it still didn't appeal to the mainstream. Even worse, it seemed to turn off hardcore JRPG fans who had been won over by Square's previous efforts. It sold 800,000 units total, with roughly half of those in Japan. Perhaps the most successful JRPG in the West for Square, outside of Mario RPG, was Final Fantasy VI. VI sold around 400,000 units in the States, and according to series creator Hironobu Sakaguchi, in terms of numbers, Final Fantasy VI didn't sell in the States. It actually did very well in Japan. I'm kind of mystified by VI's current popularity in the West because Americans didn't buy Final Fantasy VI back then. So, loosely speaking, that's the state of console RPGs. But that's only one side of the story. Because we can't forget about the PC. Ever since the dawn of PCs becoming household products back in the 80s, RPGs have been a thing, with fans of Dungeons & Dragons in particular trying to recreate the magic on computers. Ultimate Wizardry in particular set the bar for how to create a video game RPG, and even inspired series like Dragon Quest and Final Fantasy. But while PC RPGs certainly existed, and had their fans, they just didn't pop off like console games. While sales data was hard to find for all these games, from what I could find, it was incredibly rare for a game to break 100,000 units in sales. Which, look, if you're a small team, that is amazing. But it's not a mainstream success. Now, there were some mega successful RPGs on PC, for sure, like The Elder Scrolls II Daggerfall, which released in 1996 and sold roughly 700,000 copies. But they seem to be the exception rather than the rule, in general, console RPGs typically sold more units than PC RPGs, and in the States, in particular, console gaming ruled the charts in terms of mainstream successes. Either way, before 1997, the year of our lord and savior Genova, 
in the West, most RPGs were being made for the PC with no console port, and most Japanese RPGs were deemed not worth the cost to translate and export outside of Japan. To make sure I was accurate on this, I tried to search for every single RPG that released between the years of 1991 and 2003, so I could compare the difference between RPGs released before Final Fantasy VII and after Final Fantasy VII. Now, as I share this data, I want to be transparent. I got most of this info from Wikipedia on what games came out on what dates. What is or isn't an RPG I didn't want to be biased on, so I used their classification. I cross-referenced with Moby Games, and of course, in general, I used plenty of other sources including Schmupplations, Polygon, Direct Quotes, Direct Sales Data, and more. Either way, I think this gives a great rough estimate. Here are all of the RPGs released to the West from 1991 to 1997. Now, I'm going to remove all of the PC games from this list. And finally, I'll remove what I believe were games published outside of Japan to show only Japanese exports. Typically, PC RPGs were the majority of the games, and even more drastic, most of the games definitely weren't coming from Japan. I will reveal the rest of the data after Final Fantasy VII released, but that would be getting ahead of myself. So, let's talk about 1997. Prior to Final Fantasy VII, Square had had a strong relationship with Nintendo. Squaresoft had mega hits on the system, and relationships were so strong, Nintendo even licensed Square to make a Mario RPG... Mario RPG! And in the early 90s, even with competition from the PC Engine in Japan and the Sega Genesis in North America and Europe, Nintendo was on top of the world. This was, in part, thanks to the incredible third-party support the system had. Beyond amazing first-party titles from Japan, Capcom and Konami regularly released major hits onto the SNES, like Mega Man and Castlevania, with many exclusives. Meanwhile, Squaresoft and Enix pumped out some of the strongest console RPGs exclusively for Nintendo, and were pivotal to the system's successes in Japan. While Mario certainly sells Nintendo products, there's absolutely no doubt that these third-party developers and IPs were just as important. But after the Super Nintendo, Sega Genesis, and PC Engine era, a new wave of consoles powerful enough for 3D games were coming. So the team had a decision to make. Do they create Final Fantasy VII in 3D? or stick to what they knew and were good at with 2D. After serious debate, they decided to purchase Silicon Graphics workstations and create a tech demo of what Final Fantasy VI would look like in 3D. They deemed this a success and decided 3D was the only way to go. But after testing 3D on the upcoming N64's emulation kits, the team quickly realized the games were far too huge for the limited capacity of the N64 cartridge. Not only that, but according to FF7 character programmer Hiroshi Kawai, then 64 hardware just wasn't up to snuff for what they wanted to do based on their tech demo, and the PlayStation was a superior machine. Square also considered the upcoming Nintendo 64 disk drive add-on, but even then, the game would need an estimated 30 discs. Between that, and the added bonus of CD-ROMs being far cheaper than cartridges, the Square development team pitched to their president to switch to the PlayStation. And he said yes. But why the PlayStation and not Saturn? Well, on top of everything, according to then-president and chief executive officer at Square, Tomoyuki Takeichi, Sony offered them an incredible deal which included low-per-unit royalties they'd have to pay, and importantly, marketing on Sony's dime. And with that, Squaresoft swapped to making Final Fantasy VII for the PlayStation, and development began. Which I'm not going to discuss in this video. And, by 1997, development was completed. Suffice to say, Square made an incredible game with Final Fantasy VII. But, while they were certain FF7 would perform in Japan, they still weren't sure how to sell the game in the West. According to then Vice President of Marketing for Square US, Jun Iwasaki, the dream was to crack 1 million units sold, not just for Square, but for Sony. Sony hadn't reached a million for any title, a million was sort of the magic number. So, there was the mission. How do you market a JRPG in the West, when, by all accounts, Western audiences just weren't interested in console RPGs? 
In the US, Juni Wasaki specifically didn't want the term RPG mentioned in ads due to its negative connotation, while Europe struggled with a similar issue. The marketing teams decided print ads weren't going to be good enough to show just how incredible FF7's graphics were. Because really, this was truly stunning at the time. You have to believe me, this blew people away. Okay, sure, there were also the graphically incredible cutscenes, I guess. Which, honestly, the CG cutscenes and some of the various summon material in the game did absolutely blow people away. So, Sony and Square put together TV ads for Final Fantasy VII to help visually show just how impressive the game was. And now, the most anticipated epic adventure of the year will never come to a theater near you. Final Fantasy VII. After the ads came securing cover stories on various popular gaming magazines like PSM and EGM. And of course, there's also the fact that the game wasn't just good, but excellent. Japan's Famitsu gave FF7 a 38 out of 40. We gave it a 9.5 out of 10 here at GameSpot. EGM a 38 out of 40, Game Informer a 9.75 out of 10, IGN a 9.5 out of 10, Official US PlayStation Magazine 5 out of 5 stars, Nintendo Power, it didn't come out for Nintendo. <laughs> so on top of all of that advertising, it got that word of mouth because people played the game and they fell in love. And in just under three months, Square and Sony had succeeded. The game had sold over 1 million copies in the US. But that's not all. Eventually, the game would sell over 3 million units in North America and over 2 million units in Europe. In fact, worldwide, Final Fantasy VII became the second best-selling game on the PlayStation 1, selling over 10 million copies, only sitting behind Gran Turismo. It was thanks to Final Fantasy VII's success that Square was able to move forward creating the big budget CG filled games they wanted to make that many growing up in the late 90s and early 2000s fondly remember. Then president and CEO of Square, Tomoyuki Takechi, states, Basically, we went with Sony because we wanted to create titles with a lot of CG in them and make games that were different from what was already out there, and that's why we made a big investment in Final Fantasy. And because of the success of Final Fantasy VII, we were able to put out more and more titles after. Final Fantasy VII was so successful, it completely changed the way Japanese developers and publishers looked at foreign markets in relation to RPGs. It completely changed the landscape of gaming. So, remember that list I showed you earlier in the video of PC versus console RPGs? Well, here's that list again, now showing 1991 to 2003. I only stopped there because my eyes were going dry staring at my computer so much making this list. By the way, remember, mid-1997 is when Final Fantasy VII released outside of Japan. So, let's take out all of the PC RPGs. Now, let's remove all of the non-Japanese console RPGs. We have now jumped from 6 to 13 Japanese RPGs releasing a given year before Final Fantasy VII, to 16 to 33 Japanese RPGs releasing in a given year after Final Fantasy VII. The number of releases have more than doubled. On top of that, it seems like, in general, overall sales of JRPGs outside of Japan went up compared to the days before Final Fantasy VII. Sales data can be pretty hard to find, so if you want to take this part with a grain of salt, that's cool with me. Some of the best-selling SNES RPGs outside of Japan were Secret of Mana and Illusion of Gaia with around 300,000 sales each. Final Fantasy Mystic Quest sold around 400,000 units, with 6 being the standout selling 860,000 abroad, according to Squaresoft sale data. Although, I think that might include re-releases up through 2003. PS1 RPGs released prior to FF7, like Wild Arms, Beyond the Beyond, and Suikoden, sold roughly between 200 to 400,000 units abroad. Meanwhile, by 2003 abroad, FF7 sold a whopping 5.4 million units, 8 sold 4.45 million, 9 2.29 million, and 10 3.02 million. And that success wasn't only Final Fantasy related. While Chrono Trigger had sold 290,000 units abroad, its sequel, which released in 2000, sold 650,000 units. From what I could find, Breath of Fire 3, released in 1998, sold better than Breath of Fire's 1 and 2 released to the SNES. Dark Cloud was a standout success with 800,000 units sold. Golden Sun on the GBA sold over 1 million units abroad, and other standout properties like Parasite Eve and Kingdom Hearts also sold over 1 million copies abroad. 
Of course, not everything was a breakout success, but that's also true of the pre-FF7 days. The point is, if a JRPG was successful now, it was far more successful, and even mediocre successes did better than mediocre successes pre-FF7. Stop. There's more to it than this. It's absolutely worth mentioning the monolithic sales of the PS1 and how the added user base could impact these numbers. Additionally, and I'm gonna be honest with you, it costs a whole lot less to make one of these than one of these. So it was definitely far less of a risk to try out a game for the PS1 or Saturn than it was for the SNES or Genesis back in the day. But even then, the difference in releases before and after 7 is drastic, and I've read numerous quotes from marketers of the time talking about how much of an uncertainty JRPGs were to release in the West pre-FF7. And if we're going to be honest about the sales volume of the PS1 and PS2, we also have to be honest about the drastically steeper competition, as far more games were released annually for these systems. Around 2,000 games were released on the PS1, and over 4,000 games on the PS2. Meanwhile, the SNES saw 717 games released to it in North America, and the Sega Genesis saw 1,025 games released to it over the years. On the console front, Final Fantasy VII's mega popularity and success helped turn the Sony PlayStation into the most popular console of its generation. But don't take my word for it. Take former president of Sony Interactive, Shuei Yoshida's word for it. It was amazing. Everything changed after. Final Fantasy VII and Dragon Quest VII from Square Rival publisher Enix was like a one-two punch, at least for the Japanese market, that really made the PlayStation the most popular console for the generation. And while I definitely don't think FF7 was solely responsible for PlayStation's success in the West, it certainly helped. PlayStation sales drastically jumped worldwide in 1997, the same year that FF7 released, and there's definitely a good chance that a lot of these numbers were thanks to interest in the game and might have been jumps for the Sega Saturn or N64 instead had FF7 released for one of those consoles. And I may be wrong, but I'm sticking to that story. I don't think FF7 won the console war for PlayStation, but it was a major factor in its victory. So, let's recap. Final Fantasy VII released at a time when console RPGs were seen as dead in the water in the US, with very few successes and nothing approaching mainstream. But FF7 succeeded in bringing JRPGs into the mainstream. It popularized not just Final Fantasy in the West, but helped bring a wave of Japanese RPG imports that would likely have never been released, which also helped solidify the genre for Western audiences. On top of all that, it's very possible that FF7 helped win the console war for Sony and was a major factor towards PlayStation's future success in the industry as a whole, because people converted to PlayStation fans after the PS1, which certainly contributed to the PS2's success. And finally, well, it's just a damn good game.